The next big trick I want to introduce is something called an input scaling subnet. And the idea is twofold. There are two problems right now that we have with the inputs. The first is that unimportant input can slow learning. So especially you have, let's say, a large network, for example, right? A large, like, a large uh, input vector, then a lot of rubbish in there can actually uh, slow down learning. Um, obviously, f to do this thoroughly, you have things like uh, 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 input pruning and so on. But in, before you do input pruning, you need to know which inputs are important and which are not for the network itself. You can't just take, let's say, something from uh, uh, XGBoost and then try to implement those ideas here in the neural networks because they could be uh, they could be exploiting different parts of the data, so it might not translate. Okay. Now, worse, uh, if you have noise, for example, that becomes learned by the network. That's not good. Right, so we need a quick way for gradient descent slash uh, backdrop to just kill these off as early as possible, okay? But if we use, if you rely on the bottom layer of the fully connected net to do it, then each fully connected net has got uh, n weights which need to be adjusted, right? Because each each uh, each um, element of the input vector gets sent. N times. So if my input, let's say, uh, base layer 64, I got to make sure I'm zeroing 64 different numbers before I can just shut down that input so it doesn't make too much of a problem. So in practice, this rarely happens. Okay, it's too hard and too slow. Now, the second problem, and this is, I think, one that's more important for things like uh, financial time series that we discussed uh, earlier on in this, in this thing, in this talk, is that uh, outliers can dominate batch learning. So it's still possible to have outliers even after you do this kind of stuff and they can actually still uh, dominate your batch learning. Okay, If you do a uh, subtract with the mean and divide by the SD, there's no uh, guarantee that you're limiting. Uh, outliers will still be there, obviously. Okay, And they can just uh, uh, wreck your learning. Okay, so you want an, a way to just automatically reduce the outliers without making too much assumptions about their PDF and you know, that, that kind of stuff, right? It's very fussy. So the simplest way to do this, the poor man's way of doing it, is called input scaling. All right, so the idea is very simple. You've got an input vector x1 to xn. This, sorry, this is the, the vector elements, okay? Not different vectors, the vector elements, okay? So this is one input vector. And you pass it on to a uh, scaling layer, Q1 to Qn. So these are simply numbers that await that you need to learn. Okay, and this solves your first problem of trying to kill stuff off. And then there's a second problem, which is trying to squash these uh, outliers. And you can just simply use a 10H. Okay, you have to use 10H and not ReLU and some, some other stuff like that, because 10H is symmetric and your... Uh, and your outliers could be either very large or very small, I mean, very negative or very positive, okay? So that's the basic idea. Then this is what you use really as your input into the network, into your, into your upper uh, main feed forward network, okay? So, so you have just a queue, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cross product with your, your old, your old uh, X and this is your new X and typically you have a squashing function. Now, you must constrain your queues to be bigger than zero. Otherwise, you get problems. And uh, later on, we will replace the 10H with something that's more fancier uh, to actually do this kind of stuff. And that's uh, a compression decompression subnet. That's trick number four. Okay, but for now, let's just use 10H. Okay, so I've done this again in AutoCAD. And rather than running the whole thing again, I'll just show you my results. All right, so I made one change to config and that is that I'm deciding here whether I want to, so you, can you see this? Whether you want to run that 10H or not. Okay, and I think uh, the result that I got was that uh, we want to clamp. 
we do want to clamp. So let me just show you what that means. So here is my network again. So I'm just introducing the scaling function. Remember, uh, Smojo is left to right, top to bottom, right? So whatever is first is run first, whatever is second is run second, whether it's left to right or top to bottom. Uh, so the scaling is run first as my first layer, and then the septron layers come after that and followed by the final LC, right? So this is my main network here, and this one here is just my input scaling subnet. And it's just a diagonal, diagonal uh, matrix that I'm trying to learn, OK? And depending on my config, clamp on scale, I can decide whether to put this is an if, it's a conditional if, so like an n if. I can decide whether to put the 10H layer or not, OK? And when I do the losses, OK, you, you really do see a, a slight improvement uh, 0.45, right? Uh, but it's still quite, so this number here is, is it's a bit too large for comfort. I think anything above, but it's not too bad. I think it's, when you get like three and so on, I think that's when it's, you got, you know, uh, it's probably fluke. But 0.25 means it's probably going to be reproducible, but I prefer something which is something like, you know, two and below. OK, I can just order this. These are all the same copies. Uh, oh, no. So there, there would be uh, two different kinds of configurations run here, right? There's one where it's clamped, and the other one where it's unclamped. And it looks like the, sorry, the clamped wins by a large margin. So you've got one clamped, which is true. Here, one config false, and then true, 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 then false, 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 false. So the falses are pretty much uh, higher, right? So the it's more likely that if you clamp it, that you get a better result, and that's not uh, surprising. That's because uh, clamping just reduces any kind of outliers, right? Okay, and let's just check the losses again. The losses uh, is 0.45, and that's uh, two, and that's slightly better than the one that you got from the momentum uh, enforce uh, loan. Right, and, and this is something that, that's quite uh, normal in neural networks, or in fact, I think in generally speaking, is that it's diminishing returns. Each, each thing that you do extra gives you less and less uh, value. And I think we are actually juicing as much as we can from the accuracy of these models because we're just using one input. So now I think slowly we're coming to see that uh, the bottleneck is slowly becoming the uh, fact that we only use one input, which we wouldn't do normally, okay? Let's look at the uh, predictions. OK, they're not too bad. They all fooled up. OK, and you can see here that it is a lot closer. Remember, this is actually a five-week ahead forecast. For comparison, from here to here is about seven weeks. All right, so that's seven weeks. Each tick here on the, on the bottom is seven weeks. So this looks like it's almost on the money. Okay, let's let's check the the loss graphs, the uh, lag graphs, and here you can see that that this sec this primary peak, although it's still at the at the the red one is, is still at at uh, persistence at t plus five, it's much lower than it was previously, and this has become much higher, although it's more spread out, which is no good. Okay, it's much higher than it was before, so that's a good thing. Okay. In, one of the problems we're having right now also here is that this time series is very long and this one is very short. This is only just, uh, I think, one and a half cycles, one and a half years, whereas this is many years of data, okay? Which is something you probably face also when you do your own forecasting as well. We do have one question and uh, it's related to COVID-19 <laughs> predictions. <laughs> Uh, so let me just show this. Um, so any advice to forecast COVID-19 cases, confirmed cases and fatal cases by country to see when it will end? So I did a naive model using LSTM sequential model for the next week and would like to improve. Yeah. 
okay, where do I start for this question? Okay, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question because yeah. I think it's an honest question, right? Yes, I, I like yeah. that. Question. But there are a lot of pro. It, the, the question itself tells me a lot of a lot of um, a misunderstandings about forecasting. Forecasting is not magic, and these neural networks are certainly not magic. Okay. Um, so let I think that there are two issues here when it comes to forecasting, right? The first one is that all forecasts are driven by data. And so if your data is rubbish, you will produce rubbish as well. Okay, it's, it's just normal, right? So the problem that we have when it comes to COVID is that the testing that is done is uneven. Different countries have got different kinds of testing regimes, different kind of testing penetrations, etc. right? And no matter how good your testing is, you can only test so much in a day. So you don't really know when uh, or how many cases out there, uh, and you don't know uh, how fast. Uh, you don't you don't know how many how many how many cases out there, and you don't know a lot of different things. The other thing is that uh, it's a moving target as well, because um, there are many things that you that you're not that your data can't capture, like you know how well is social distancing distancing happening, right? You're not capturing things like uh, temperature of the different countries, right? Which you really need for a forecast. When I when, when COVID first came out, now I was quite struck that uh, where you get high infection rates, uh, China, uh, Iran, and uh, Italy, for example, right? Where it spread very fast. Of course, there were a lot of other factors involved. One of the common things that were there also was weather, where it was a, mm -hmm. all the dry climates at that point in time because it's winter. And a temperature between, I think, uh, ten to twelve Celsius, right? So as climate, as, as the uh, as the weather changes, obviously you get different changes as well. And humidity has been known also to prevent uh, viruses from spreading. So there are so many factors out there which are not captured in models that just look at the data. Plus, the data itself is very questionable. Okay, in terms of even if they report it honestly, uh, whether they report it on time, whether there's bias in the reporting itself, okay, don't 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 neglect when it comes to things like healthcare and so on. You gotta be very suspicious of data. You have to be suspicious of healthcare data because there's money involved. For example, if you look at the cases in New York, you find that that rate attributed to COVID is very high. But if you look at the death rate elsewhere around the US or even in Europe, etc., and so on, the death rates are much lower, right? And that's really that could be because in New York people are in I mean the, I think the governor I think he gave money for I think if you are recording these these victims, etc. Right? So I'm not sure about the details, but the thing is that there's also a money money involved, right? So the reporting could be biased or skewed. So the first part of my of my of my of my warning to the person who asked this question is that it's a good question, but the data is very suspect. Mm. Okay, so the second part is that uh, is the process modelable or not? All right. So I think I've answered a bit about that, and that is that there are other things in the model that you need to introduce which you don't know. Okay. That, that, that's the uh, second thing. The third thing is that uh, on the, on the, do you really need to use a network like uh, LSTM? Right? So LSTMs are hard to train, and if you don't know what you're doing, you can easily burn yourself. Okay? So even with a simple uh, setup like this, so I purposely did today simple. Because it's reproducible and you can really, uh, extract a lot of uh, insights, but when you introduce things like uh, uh, what call memory in your model, where it's stateful, then it becomes a lot harder to debug and a lot harder to understand.